This is the Word of Truth Video Library, number VL9. Nathan C. Johnson, Bible Teacher. I greet you in the faith and fellowship of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose we are, whom we love, and whom we serve. One of the most difficult questions we must ask ourselves regarding God, life, and the world is the why question. And that is why, if there is a God who is all good, and who is all loving, and who is all powerful, who made the world, why is this world in such a mess? Why is it often such a terrible place to live? Why do such terrible calamities and tragedies happen? Now, one of the sad situations we face in this world is the reality of sickness, injury, and illness, and disease. I'm living, as I record this, as we are probably coming out of the tail end of the coronavirus or the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 pandemic that caused so much trouble in the world. And, sadly, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people died from this pandemic. And the sad reality of poor health is something that sometimes people have to live with their whole lives who have chronic illnesses or handicaps. And the fact is that, of course, God made us fearfully and wonderfully with wonderful bodies, wonderfully created, and yet sometimes these bodies go wrong. They're racked by disease, or some tragedy happens, or they're just born with defects. And so we ask, why did the good God allow the sad reality of sickness into this world? Now, we can understand as God first created this world, back in the beginning, and we talked about that right at the beginning of the why question, the beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden, that he created us with the solution to injury. Genesis 2 and verse 9 says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of life was provided right in the middle of the garden, where it's easiest to access and quickest to access, for Adam and Eve to eat of it freely and to use it freely. Now this tree of life was all about healing. Now as long as we have physical bodies like we do, of course you can have some kind of accident, you can harm the physical body. It doesn't have to be about illness, it doesn't have to be about a disease, but as long as you have a physical body, you can have some kind of accident and you can need healing. Well, the healing was provided freely with the tree of the knowledge Well, the healing was provided freely with the tree of life. Now, there's also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And evil there, as I told you before, actually means calamity, like cancer is an evil or a car accident is an evil. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God told Adam and Eve not to eat of, but they disobeyed him and ate of it at Satan's instigation, that's what brought sickness into the world. Now, in Genesis 3.22, we see the power of the tree of life. When after Adam and Eve sinned, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. And God just stops his statement right there, like it's too terrible to think about. Because he indicates here that the tree of life was so powerful that it would have even healed the physical damage done to Adam and Eve by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and would stop them from dying. However, while it could have fixed the physical damage of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it could not have fixed the moral damage that Adam and Eve did to themselves when they listened to Satan, went his way, and disobeyed God. So the idea that Adam and Eve could heal the physical infirmity with their bodies and live as morally corrupt beings forever was unthinkable. So God saw to it that they couldn't do it, verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims 
cherubs as we call them, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So this, this sword would, would move every direction around the tree. And whichever direction you tried to approach the tree from, why the sword would move there to block you. So, so no human being could get to the tree of life, heal himself of the physical ailments caused by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and yet remain as a moral, morally corrupt being forever. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil could have healed any illness, sickness, or injury anyone got. And well, I believe sickness generally would have been unknown if they hadn't eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Injury could have happened, and yet that tree would have taken care of it. And someday that tree will be provided again, according to Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter in the Bible. In verse 2, describing the new Jerusalem, the glorious city of God, it says, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So we see here that it was not just the fruit it was all about, it was also about the leaves that were there to heal. And we, we know today there are some leaves who provide healing properties in, in some cases. But the tree of life was far beyond that. And someday in the New Jerusalem, there will be the tree of life there to provide leaves for the healing of the nations. So this will bring all sickness to an end for good. Now when God established his nation of Israel, he established an agreement with them, and that agreement included sickness. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, God talked with Israel about what he would do if they obeyed him. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 3, if they obeyed him and walked in all his precepts, he says, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Wherever you are, you'll be blessed. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. So you'll be blessed in everything, he says. Everything will go well for you. But then we compare that, what he says, this will happen to you if you don't obey me, if you worship other gods and don't serve me. He says, verse 21, The Lord shall make the pestilence, disease, plague, cleave unto thee, until you have consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with a sword, and with blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. So God said, if you obey me, I will see to it that you're healthy and strong. But if you disobey me, I'll blast you with plague and illness. I understand that that's how he treated Israel under covenant with him, but that's not how God acts today. We live in the dispensation of the grace of God. And God says in Ephesians 4.32 regarding his actions today, in our actions today, he says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. But that word translated forgiving there is the Greek charizomai, charis being the word for grace, and it means dealing graciously with one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath dealt graciously with you. So today, God deals graciously with us in everything, and he tells us to deal graciously with each other. So God is dealing graciously today. And... So when he is dealing graciously, well, he is, is not just punishing people with illness. Some people think every time somebody gets sick, it must be God is angry and punishing them. No. No, he's dealing graciously with you. He's not going to blast you with illness. Now, there were specific illnesses that God would blast Israel with if they were wicked. And one that particularly symbolized sin was leprosy. In Leviticus chapter 13, now I believe that leprosy, the, the terrible scourge on Israel, was not the same thing as Hansen's disease, which is called leprosy today. Because I believe the way the Bible says to diagnose biblical leprosy, I don't think you could do that to diagnose Hansen's disease. But Leviticus 13 says, The Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab or bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons, the priests. So see how leprosy was connected with the priesthood, not with some kind of medical profession, but with religion. So I believe it was a religious plague. God would bring it upon people for their sin. Verses 45 and 46 of the same chapter say, uh, the, the terrible quarantine the leper in that day had to, had to go through. It says, And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, torn, and his head bare, 
and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry, Unclean! Unclean! All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone by himself. Without the camp shall his habitation be, out where no one else lives. You have these leper colonies where no one can go. So until they were healed, if they ever were, lepers had to be absolutely quarantined. Now interestingly, the most famous figure in the Bible, I think, may have been struck with leprosy, was David. The great King David, after his sin with Bathsheba, one of the punishments God might have brought upon him was, for a time, not permanently, of course, but for a time he might have brought upon him the terrible scourge of leprosy. We read about this in Psalm 38. After David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, he says, Psalm 38, verse 1, this is a psalm of David to bring to remembrance, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as a heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. So stinking, corrupt wounds, that sounds to me a lot like the plague of leprosy. Verse 6, I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. So the loins filled with a loathsome disease, this has caused some people to speculate this could have been an STD. But I don't think so. I think David was struck with leprosy. Verse 8, I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth. My strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore, and my kinsmen, my relatives, stand afar off. In other words, that sounds a lot to me like leprosy. David's closest friends, his relatives, they have to stand far away from him because he's a leper. Well, he was quarantined. Well, of course, for David, it was temporary. I think God eventually healed him. And he was back to normal, just like God forgave his sin with Uriah and Bathsheba. But there's also another psalm, which I would call the Great Psalm of the Leper, Psalm 88. This may be the only chapter in the Psalms that ends on a negative note. And in Psalm 88, this is a mass kill, instruction of Heman the Ezraite. He says, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. So he says, I'm like one who's already dead. And this was the reality of the living death of leprosy. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. Thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves, Selah. And notice this, he considers that this illness is a sign of God's wrath. And that was illness in Israel, and leprosy in particular. Verse 8, Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. Again, this describes the quarantine of leprosy, where no one could come near you. He says, verse 9, Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. So he says his eye mourns, his eye wastes away because of his illness. Verse 10, Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. So he's arguing, don't let me die. <laughs> Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. In other words, meet you as you get up, as if God was waking up in the morning. A little bit of anthropomorphism there. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? 
Why hidest thou thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. He says, I've had this terrible illness since I was young, since my youth. And that's an awful thing when young people get chronic illnesses. And for the rest of their life, they have to suffer from them. Verse 16, thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me, in the, the quarantine, and mine acquaintance into darkness. And that ends this gloomy psalm. Again, a rare psalm that ends on a negative note. It ends in darkness. As if he anticipates being swallowed in the darkness of death. And that sadly sometimes is the outcome of illness, isn't it? Sometimes illness ends in death. Well, praise God, as we discussed earlier, the answer for death is resurrection. But understand that for all the terrors of death and the terrors of illness, the Lord is no friend of illness. In fact, the Lord, while he was on earth, proved himself to be an enemy of sickness and illness. Matthew chapter 8, in verse 16, we read of some of the Lord's actions during his ministry. It says, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So this tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ took away affirmity, infirmities and sicknesses. And he bore them himself, just like he did sin and death. He bore sin and death on the cross. He bore illness on the cross as well. And this, again, shows that illness is connected with sin and with death. It wasn't something God planned to be in the world. He planned for injury, but not for these sicknesses and chronic injuries. He had the tree of life to take care of any hurt that happened to anyone. Now, the Lord not only opposed sickness while he was on earth, but he sent his disciples to do the same in Matthew chapter 10. In verse 7, he told them as he sent them out, his 12, and as ye go, preach, proclaim, saying, The kingdom of the heavens is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils or demons. Freely have received, freely give. So they were to go out and proclaim the kingdom of the heavens at hand, and as a demonstration of what it's going to be like when God rules this world through his government, they were to cast illness, sickness, out of everyone they encountered. So the Lord was all about taking care of sickness. And his claim was that when his government comes, sickness will be gone for good. Now, in fact, the Lord's healing even extended to raising the dead. When John, the baptizer, sent his disciples to the Lord, wondering, are you really the Messiah we are waiting for? Because John, after his support of Jesus Christ, he was arrested by Herod and thrown in prison. And one thing Messiah was supposed to do was free the prisoners, and yet John wasn't getting freed. So he sent to the Lord asking him, Are you really the Messiah or not? And the Lord's answered him, Jesus answered and said unto them, that is, the disciples John had sent, Go, and show God, John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor of the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So he says, tell them five things I do, four having to do with illness, and one having to do with I actually raise the dead. So the Lord opposed sickness, even to the point of, of raising the dead. And yet, when I consider the Lord, the Lord's healing miracles, and some people think, well, the Lord healed then, he should heal now. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever he healed, then he should heal now. For that I say nonsense. That's talking about the Lord's character never changing. But that doesn't mean his work never changes. And the fact is that the Lord's healing ministry was limited. And in fact, I believe it was limited while he was on earth in the fact that he healed during his ministry the last three years of his around 33-year life and not before. When Mary, at the marriage in Cana of Galilee, asked the Lord to do something about the fact that he'd run out of wine, he said in John 2 and verse 4, Jesus said unto her, his, his mother woman, 
and that was a term of endearment in Greek, dear woman, more like, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. He said, my hour to show powerful signs and miracles hasn't come yet. Now, in the apocryphal writings, the writings that weren't inspired by the Holy Spirit, but just made up by somebody about Jesus, they'll talk about him doing all kinds of miracles before his ministry began. Often there are superfluous miracles just to show off his power, unlike the miracles of Scripture. But the fact is, as far as we can tell from the Bible, the Lord didn't perform any miracles until the start of his ministry. And in fact, it appears that that even extended to the fact that Joseph, his foster father, probably became sick. I mean, we don't see any sign that Joseph was alive once the Lord's ministry began. Even this marriage, his mother's there, but his father isn't. And it would appear he didn't heal to the extent that Joseph, his foster father, became sick and died, and he didn't heal him. He didn't raise him from the dead. He let him die rather than heal before the right time to heal. So the Lord's healing ministry was limited. Now, when the Lord's ministry ended, he sent out his apostles. But he sent them the same way he was sent. John 20 and verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. So he sent out his apostles to continue his ministry, and he sent them the way he was sent. Which meant, of course, one of the ways he was sent was to oppose sickness. And we see that that's the way it was in the Acts period. Yet the apostles were able to oppose and conquer illness and disease. In Acts 3, verses 6 through 8, we read that Peter and John worked a great miracle of healing. It says, Then Peter said, this was to a lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. So Peter and John did the same sort of miracles that the Lord did was on, while he was on earth and healed. And they said how they did it. It wasn't through some knowledge they had, verse 16. And his name, that is Jesus Christ's name, through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So they healed in Jesus Christ's name. Now this healing ministry extended even beyond, it seems, some of the things the Lord did, to the extent of Acts chapter 5 and verse 14, where we read that, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least a shadow of Peter, passing by, might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities, round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. So even Peter's shadow could heal, and heal every one who needed healing. But if you think that's spectacular, Paul in his ministry, it seems, got even more spectacular. In Acts chapter 19, and verse 11, it says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So now normal run-of-the-mill miracles, special ones. So that from his body were brought onto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So Paul could send a handkerchief or an apron, a cloth, from his body that he had touched to the sick in another place, and they would be healed. So, the miracles of healing and the acts of the apostles were spectacular. And yet, Acts 20 and verse 25, this was all connected with the proclamation of the kingdom of God, the government of God, that was being demonstrated at that time. And that was what Paul's ministry was all about. Acts 20, 25, Paul says, And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone, preaching or proclaiming the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So connected with God's coming government was this demonstration of the government's health care in the great healing that were provided, that was provided to the people. However, what about healing today? When we don't live in God's kingdom, we live in the dispensation of grace. Does God heal today? 
Well, consider Philippians chapter 2 and verses 25 through 30. Where Paul writes, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my fellow brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. So he said, I wanted to send my brother in the Lord Epaphroditus, my fellow soldier, fellow worker, to you, because he's one of you. He says, verse 26, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, because that he had heard that he had been sick. Epaphroditus, my brother, had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Now wait a minute, Paul. If Epaphroditus was sick, why didn't you just send him a handkerchief or apron? Why didn't you just cast a shadow on him? Why didn't you heal him and raise him up? Why did you just kind of wring your hands and pray and, and hope God had mercy on him? Why didn't you heal? We see the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and verse 23. Also toward the end of Paul's ministry. He tells Timothy this, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thine often infirmities. Timothy was getting sick often? Paul, why didn't you send him a handkerchief or apron? Paul doesn't send him a handkerchief or apron. He doesn't say, well, wait till I get there, I'll heal you. No, he sends him medical advice. The water there is bad, that's causing you problems. Uh, drink a little wine with the water and that'll kill the bacteria and you'll be okay. See, medical advice, not healing. And then in the last book Paul wrote, I believe it was the last book written of the New Testament, in fact, but the last book Paul wrote, one of the last things he says, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 20, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at my leadum sick. So one of Paul's companions, he left behind him sick. Why didn't he heal him miraculously? Why did he leave him sick? These three passages show us clearly that the powers of miraculous healing had passed off the scene before Paul's ministry ended. And I believe this change took place at the great dispensational dividing line of Acts 28, 28, when we went from the kingdom of God to the dispensation of grace. Now, I believe when God heals today, and I believe that he does, but I believe that he heals in ways that could always be attributed to causes that are secondary. So that the, the unbeliever could always say, oh, that was just a coincidence, or that was just the medicine he took, or that was just rest, or that happens sometimes so forth. And you couldn't prove in a court of law that God had done anything, that God had healed anyone. And so God, when he heals today, he heals behind the scenes. And he doesn't heal through mediators, he doesn't heal through healers, he doesn't heal miraculously. He heals graciously. And sadly, many times he doesn't heal at all. But when someone is sick in our experience, we need to do what Paul advises us to do in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be careful or be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests, including requests for healing, let your requests be made known unto God. And what does he say? And you'll get them all? No. He says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep or guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Your peace, your unity with God, will guard your heart and mind, no matter the outcome, whether you get your request or not. So when we're faced with illness today, we must pray and ask God for help and just accept whatever answer we get. And I've had to do that myself with my own sick relatives. So we understand that in the beginning, God provided for the perfect health of all his creatures with the tree of life. But that went out the window when mankind sinned and rebelled against God at Satan's instigation. Israel had promises for health if they obeyed God and promises of sickness if they didn't. But God makes no such promises in the dispensation of grace. The Lord Jesus Christ, while he was on earth, showed he was the enemy of sickness and disease, and when his kingdom comes, all disease will be eliminated. The apostles healed diseases like Christ did at first, but toward the end of Paul's ministry, why the manifest miracles of healing stopped. Then Paul, as we do today, had to present his request for help and healing to God and be at peace no matter what happened. And we should remember, if worst comes to worst, God's answer to death is resurrection. And praise God for the resurrection. So that is the answer to the question, why illness?
But until we meet again around the pages of God's book, I bid you goodbye.